Okay. Well, good evening. Um, I'm uh, Dr. Phoenix Nguyen. Um, and tonight I welcome you to our program. I'm very excited. We have a very um, uh, important topic to talk about tonight, uh, heartburn or acid reflux and um, GERD. They're synonymous terms and um, we're going to talk a little bit about prevention to progression uh, to um, esophageal cancer. Uh, next slide. So before we talk about the more important topic of esophageal cancer, we'll uh, touch a little bit about um, the more common entity of heart conditions and atrial fibrillation, coronary artery disease as it relates to heartburn. And often the symptoms of heartburn and the heart attack can overlap. Uh, heartburn, angina, a heart attack feels very much uh, similar and it can present in a, an identical way. Uh, even very experienced doctors who do what I do, cardiologists, um, can't always tell the difference between the um, heart uh, causing the symptom and the esophagus or uh, patients with heartburn. And it's based on our exam, our medical history. It's difficult to uh, differentiate the two. And when a patient comes in the emergency room, they have chest pain, the immediate first test, of course, we want to rule out a heart attack. Um, and then we look at heart. I mean, we look at the esophagus after the heart. It's in the same area. Uh, next slide. Um, is uh, gastroesophageal reflux disease or GERD related to heart disease? And um, the answer isn't simple, um, but I've broken it down uh, to a few different points that um, are salient. The patients with GERD are more likely to have heart disease. Um, abnormal heartbeat, plaque buildup, reduced blood flow to the heart. And um, in 2010, heart disease caused one of every four deaths in the US. So heart disease is common, and we will see later that GERD is also very common. Um, patients with heart disease are twice as likely to have a prior diagnosis of GERD. And um, a study looking at a subset of patients who sought care for GERD also had heart disease. So they're interrelated. GERD is very common. Um, we think that a one, in quarter, uh, one in four people have GERD. And here we see that heart disease is also very common. Um, and it's unclear. Uh, there is some thoughts out there between the link of uh, uh, heart disease and GERD. Um, is it because it's in proximity? Um, the heart to the esophagus is so close, it's millimeters away. Is that why? Um, and uh, they have similar risk. So patients with cardiovascular disease or heart conditions can be obese, they have diabetes, high blood pressure, abnormal cholesterol, or they can have GERD. And patients with GERD also have obesity and other risks um, that are seen in heart uh, patients. Uh, next slide. Uh, what is uh, the non-cardiac chest pain that's thought to um, cause uh, pain? And this predominantly is from GERD, uh, from gastroesophageal reflux. It's a very a heterogeneous disorder, but it's a substantial disorder that costs um, a lot of resource uh, use and substantial healthcare costs in the US. So non-cardiac chest pain are recurrent episodes of chest pain that is uh, not known to be cardiac related. After all the workup we've done, uh, stress tests, we've done cardiac evaluation with a negative exam. Um, of course, we fear that this more serious and more life-threatening heart disease as a cause, um, and again, they often overlap. Patients with chest pain uh, with the initial presentation, uh, only about 11 to 40% of uh, the patients are ultimately diagnosed with coronary artery disease. So you're looking at a big percentage of patients that come in with pain, initial presentation, and it isn't the heart. So what is it? Um, 
diagnosis of non-cardiac chest pain, usually by diagnosis of exclusion, you exclude um, the heart condition first. Uh, once cardiac causes have been ruled out, then we look at non-cardiac chest pain. Then we come into this area of um, GERD, so gastroesophageal reflux. Next slide. Uh, why GERD um, in patients with coronary heart disease? Um, uh, some of the drugs that we use in the treatment of heart conditions um, can increase uh, the GERD frequency. Um, in, uh, there's influence between the esophagus disturbance and coronary or the heart perfusion. Um, there are some vagal reflexes that are involved. And so the mechanisms are not clear, but there are multiple potential mechanisms. Um, next slide. Won't bore you with all that, but the next uh, area that I really have a strong focus of um, research interest on is the incidence of atrial fibrillation and GERD. Um, a lot of shared predisposition factors, uh, predisposition, predisposing factors like lifestyle changes, um, the patients are usually sedentary. Um, there is some inflammatory reaction that occurs in the esophagus that affects the heart. Um, and GERD or gastroesophageal reflux can cause an irritation and perpetuation of the atrial fibrillation. The left atrium where it um, initiates from is again, three millimeters away, millimeters away from the esophageal wall. Um, many different potential mechanisms like local inflammation. Um, next slide. So um, other areas that GERD can influence are patients with uh, laryngeal pharyngeal reflux. So patients can present with cough and hoarseness. They present to the head and neck physician to work this up and they are given a diagnosis of LPR. So is LPR related to GERD? And so then with this, with the worry of the recurrent cough, we undergo um, an evaluation for GERD. Um, so GERD can be associated with heart condition, can be associated with um, head and neck conditions like cough and change in voice, and it can be associated with uh, pulmonary conditions as well. Uh, next slide. So why are we worried? We're worried because GERD can uh, be associated with uh, development of cancer. Uh, cancer of the esophagus is on the rise. Uh, incidence is risen compared to 1975. You see uh, in the middle graph, 600% uh, increase in the incidence of esophageal cancer. So that really beats out melanoma, lung cancer, and um, esophageal cancer is a type of cancer that is, um, has high uh, rates of death and morbidity associated with it. So along with the incidence, you also see mortality on the third uh, graph on the right. Um, as you have rising incidence, there's death associated with it. So um, we worry about GERD because of, um, possibility of association with esophageal cancer. Next slide. So what is GERD? So we're jumping into the meat of the talk now that I, I covered why it's important that we're focusing on GERD. And it's an abnormal uh, frequent reflux of stomach contents. So often patients uh, understand or they think that it's an overproduction of acid in the stomach and it actually isn't. But you have stomach acid, you normally produce stomach acid, but the stomach acid is now going back into the esophagus. It's refluxing back and doing its uh, damage. And the typical GERD symptoms are include um, heartburn. You can have chest pain, like we talked about, excessive salivation, regurgitation. You can have gas bloating, um, trouble sleeping. Um, the atypical GERD symptoms can be that persistent cough that I talked about, uh, or that LPR, uh, a sore throat, constant clearing of the throat, hoarseness. And in here, you also see, see asthma. There is COPD conditions thought to be associated with GERD. Um, the uh, dental conditions like uh, 
bad odor, mouth odor, dental erosions, gum disease, and the list there goes on. Um, so there are typical symptoms and there are atypical symptoms. You can have atypical symptoms without the typical symptoms and vice versa. Next slide. What happens uh, to cause the GERD? It is an anatomic abnormality that occurs over the years. So at the top, you see a normal structure. Um, when you eat, the food goes into your esophagus. Um, at the bottom of the esophagus, there's a sphincter muscle, and that muscle will open up as the food goes in, the sphincter closes up again. So the stomach lies below the diaphragm. The diaphragm is what separates your chest and your abdomen. And that's what you breathe with. So when you breathe, the diaphragm flattens out. When you breathe in and you breathe out, the diaphragm works to help you breathe. And um, what happens at the bottom is in patients with GERD, part of the stomach has slid up into the chest above the level of the diaphragm, and that's called a hiatal hernia. So the hiatal hernia is associated with GERD, and it's one of the failure of the mechanism um, seen in patients with GERD. Other things are um, the lower soft sphincter can get shorter, weaker, uh, intermittently it can relax, and that's when you have gastroesophageal reflux disease. Um, the angle of hiss is the angle between your esophagus and your stomach. And in patients without GERD, it's more obtuse an angle, and it becomes wider of an angle in patients with GERD. Um, there are also ligaments and structure that hold the, uh, the anatomy in place. And those ligaments can be broken. Uh, those membranes get broken over the years of uh, eating. Next slide. So now we know, we understand that it's a mechanical uh, failure of the bottom of the esophagus. So we now understand there are two sphincters that uh, operate uh, to keep the stomach contents in the stomach. And one is the diaphragm. So the diaphragm is noted in green and the lower esophageal sphincter, that muscle is noted in blue. So these two sphincters are what um, has failed in patients with GERD. Next slide. So uh, GERD is spectrum disease. So you have milder disease to more severe conditions. So the milder conditions would be if you have an occasional heartburn, um, you take uh, Tums or Melox now and then, um, and then you go to the point where you have to adjust your lifestyle and you eat smaller meals, you avoid all the foods in life that are good, that'll bring on the GERD symptoms like tomatoes and wine and chocolates and caffeine and all those good things um, can increase uh, GERD. Um, once that has uh, tr been tried, uh, then we talk about uh, medicine or pharmaceuticals. So these medicine fall in the category of anti-acid medications. So the anti-acid medications are used to suppress the acid. So when the stomach contents go up into your esophagus, you're actually not feeling the burn or the acid associated with it. Um, as the disease progress, then you can go into more severe condition and it can go into precancer called Barrett's esophagus. It can go into more inflammatory process called esophagitis. Um, and the more severe the condition, we would intervene more. Um, the conventional surgery um, has been around. It's called Neeson fundoplication. And uh, very few patients actually elect to have surgery over the many years due to its invasiveness and high complication rates. Um, and of course, uh, a higher side effect um, profile. Um, so what do we have? Uh, next slide. We have, like I talked about, the medications to suppress acid in your stomach. Uh, so they're the simple, more uh, lighter anti-acid medication like Tums, Maalox, and then you have the H2 blocker, which is the next line up. Um, and the H2 blockers are often used uh, three times a day. Uh, you take it uh, sometimes as needed, or you can take it around the clock. Um, the stronger 
anti-acid medications called the PPI, which is a proton pump inhibitor. And some of these are over the counter. They're very similar in its action. Um, it's often used um, every 12 hours um, to suppress uh, acid. Uh, next slide. PPI, um, we, we've been using it for many years and we thought that, you know, it's pretty safe and keep patients on it. Um, patients have come and see me and they've been on it for 20 years. And we used to think that it's more of a benign drug and it's okay to take. Um, and gradually the patients go, well, you know, it's not working as well as it used to. And that's because the, the process has evolved and the condition has worsened. And now we understand that with long-term PPI use, there are many potential side effects. And the list is long. Um, some of it, is, there are stronger studies looking at it. But if you look here, they list everything from dementia to stroke to cardiovascular disease. And I think the, the two most believable or uh, the stronger studies are, uh, I think, chronic kidney conditions and um, osteoporosis. So patients with osteoporosis on chronic PPI, um, we want to look at the indication for the PPI use. Uh, is it clearly indicated? Can the patient go off the PPI? Um, then there are larger studies looking now at uh, high risk of colon cancer in patients on chronic PPI. Um, higher COVID infection rates on um, patients with chronic PPI. Um, potentially, uh, some of these actually make sense though, because your stomach, you need to produce the acid and now you're shutting it off and your stomach is just not meant to have no acid. Um, next slide. So initial diagnostic tests for GERD, um, usually we would like to do an endoscopy where we put a scope, we put a camera down, look at your esophagus and look at the esophagus to make sure there's no complications of GERD, like esophagitis. We talked about Barrett's esophagus, which is a precancer condition. Um, look for any anatomic abnormality, any structuring the esophagus. Um, Usually prior to any treatment of GERD, we'd like to look at the severity of the condition and we do a pH test. Uh, pH test is um, a little capsule, it's called Bravo. We place it on the inside lining of the esophagus and we have the patients wear a monitor for four days. And during those four days, we ask the patient not to take any anti-acid medication because we wanna measure the acid that's coming up from the stomach into the esophagus. So here we look at um, severity of the condition. We look at daytime, nighttime reflux. We look to correlate patient symptoms with an acid reflux event. Um, the manometry, what you see on the left of the screen is a functional test. We look at the um, uh, motility or how the esophagus is squeezing to get the food out to make sure that that's normal. Um, make sure we don't have any other um, diagnosis that can mimic GERD um, before we look into fixing the GERD. Um, we sometimes obtain an esophageal gram where we have patients swallow a little bit of contrast. We take an x-ray picture to make sure that there's no stricture, uh, give a broad um, uh, anatomic uh, picture, uh, look at a little bit on um, function as well. Next slide. So um, in between the lifestyle modifications and the medication use and more invasive surgical intervention, now we have uh, the transoral um, technique and it's called transoral incisionless fund applications called TIF. Um, and this has been around, um, I think the newer development was that now uh, different payers have caught on and um, it's a non-invasive technique, it's incisionless, and there's so many studies out there um, showing that it's effective. And with durability data up to 10 year follow-up, um, many thousands of procedures up to date. And we have, um, 
uh, this technique that, again, offers uh, potential therapy and a treatment gap between those who take medications and are refractory um, and those who don't want the more invasive uh, surgical intervention with the niece and fun application. Um, covered by most public and private payers endorsed by surgical and GI societies. Next slide. So this is an overview of what TIF is. I'm pretty excited about this um, because um, the device is so good and it's gone through so many iterations that it's um, fairly um, easy after a certain number of procedures to do, and it's very reproducible. Every valve looks very similar. And it's a device, we place it inside the esophagus and stomach. That little black uh, line is the endoscope. We, we use it and we curl it back up so that we can see the work that we do. And it's a full thickness uh, tissue fold that we pull down at the junction between the esophagus and the stomach. And these fasteners are placed, uh, they're like sutures, and we create on the right picture a three centimeter valve and it acts like a flat valve and it's a 270 degree wrap. So actually you're not getting a 360 wrap and it's just enough, it's not too tight, just enough that patients can swallow, but they're not refluxing. So um, that's what the valve looks like at the end of the creation of the TIF procedure. Next slide. So the evidence is really strong. We have systematic reviews out there with randomized trials, many cohort studies, um, hundreds of app, uh, publications on the device um, with long year follow, uh, 10 year follow up. Next slide. Um, you're looking at quality improvement. Um, the, the line drops to the bottom and even at five years when the symptoms improve, their quality of life improve, it stays improved. Next slide. Uh, elimination of regurgitation. So this is important because you take the anti-acid medication, it suppresses the acid, you don't feel the burn, but you're still regurgitating. So taking care of the GERD, creating this valve gets rid of the regurgitation so things don't come back up, whether it's acidic or non-acidic. Next slide. Uh, also, we note uh, elimination of the atypical symptoms and uh, improvement of symptoms that last uh, up to five years. So the atypical symptoms are uh, the cough and the hoarseness, um, the clearing of the throat. Next slide. Um, outcome, so we talked about the patient's symptoms, uh, the subjective improvement in symptoms, quality of life, regurgitation, um, how the patient feel. And here are the objective outcomes of performing this procedure and creating the valve. Um, and these studies look at it percentage of patients going off their medication. And it's fairly good across the many studies and also the improvement in esophagitis. So these are objective measures that we use to see whether this technique works for patients with GERD. Next slide. Um, here is uh, the pH study at baseline compared to post-procedure. And you see improvement in the pH score as well. Next slide. Um, so effectiveness, I'm uh, just going to summarize how effective uh, the TIF uh, procedure is, and it improves heartburn, regurgitation, quality of life, like we talked about, improvement of pH study scores, uh, decreased need for PPI use, um, and some patients uh, even going off PPI. Um, and I think the TIF valve is better than PPI, like we talked about in eliminating or regurgitating like regurgitation um, or even reducing it because um, it's more than the anti-acid medication, which just cuts the acid. Um, next slide. Uh, many meta-analysis looking at uh, uh, TIF. Next slide. Durability, uh, picture post-TIF immediately. 
and one year post, uh, the valve looks very similar. In five years post, the valve looks very similar. Uh, the good thing about this, I think, is that we can always touch up. That is, if the valve uh, loosens up over the years or the patient has recurrent symptoms, is something that we can do endoscopically. Uh, that once we do TIF, we can TIF again. Next slide. Um, this is looking at patients with a height of hernia. Um, if it's a larger height of hernia, two centimeters or larger or longer and wider, then this is what we would do. It's a height of hernia repair and TIF. So what we do is either robotically or laparoscopically, we would bring the stomach down, repair the diaphragm, and then endoscopically create that TIF valve. And this is called a CTIF, and here uh, it looks at improvement um, in patient symptoms. Next slide. Um, adverse events uh, are minor. Um, major side effects, uh, we noted uh, a few years ago with perforation when we didn't have as much experience uh, with the later years as our experience has accumulated and we're getting so much better at doing and creating the valves, the complication rates are low. Uh, next slide. Indications are, uh, I look at it as three main categories. So patients with GERD symptoms despite PPI use. So PPI is the strongest anti-acid medication you have. So if patients have persistent symptoms on maximal dose. Um, the second, I think, would be if patients are on chronic PPI and they worry about all the side effects of the PPI and would like to go off PPI. Um, and I think the third uh, concern that I see patients for are if they had Barrett's esophagus or they're concerned about the development of cancer with chronic GERD. Um, patients with, of course, uh, abnormal pH testing to diagnose the GERD, uh, we'd like to see that before we perform a fun application. Patients with um, a hiatal hernia that is smaller than two centimeters, then TIF straight, bigger than two centimeters, then we do what's called a C-TIF. Next slide. Contraindications, uh, traditionally in the literature, what is reported is that patients are with a BMI greater than 35. Uh, of course, if there are esophageal strictures or varices, we cannot uh, perform uh, TIF. Patients with eosinophilic esophagitis, uh, where it's severe and it's very tight, uh, it's hard to pass the TIF device. Patients with very, very limited neck mobility um, due to prior spinal fusion or surgery. Um, of course, if they've had gastric or esophageal resection. Um, Next slide, I think uh, that would be my last. And if you have any questions, please give us a call here. And uh, tonight I have the honor uh, to introduce to you um, Mr. Robert Brunswick. He's a patient of ours and he'd like to share with you his story, his journey from uh, the beginning to the end, um, Mr. Brunswick. Thank you. First of all, uh, let me apologize. Uh, I don't normally have a hoarse voice, but I do tonight because I went to the Rams game yesterday and had uh, quite a lot of fun. As for, if there's other Ram fans on the uh, the uh, broadcast here, um, you will uh, appreciate my enthusiasm. Nonetheless, um, Dr. Nguyen asked me to say a few remarks tonight and share you a little bit about my journey, maybe before, uh, during, and after. So. I, I kind of consider it pay it forward. I'm happy to do it and uh, would be happy to answer any questions that you might all have. Um, so I'm 62, uh, great health, uh, workout fanatic. So I was quite surprised when I decided uh, uh, or I, I learned more about my, my condition regarding the uh, kind of the acid reflux. Uh, I think the best way to describe it is I had had GERD and acid reflux, but I really had very minor symptoms. I didn't do uh, much about it in terms of PPIs. I had very ir uh, heartburn irregularly. Um, so I would just kind of continue along with once in a while recognizing that there was a discomfort. Um, I was due for a, a colonoscopy, you know, you get one every 10 years. So I asked my doctor, I said, why don't we do 
and endoscopy at the same time. I'm curious um, how the other half is doing. So that was easy enough to do. Uh, seven minutes, uh, eight minutes, I think, to do the endoscopy. And the doctor came back and said, well, you have a, a little bit of lining change. Um, and I'd like you to come back in two years for another endoscopy just to make sure we don't have a pre-Barrett's condition. So, you know, two, two years, uh, wasn't looking forward to it, but followed through. And uh, sure enough, when I did it again, I had a little bit more uh, pre-Barrett's. So with that, I, I, I asked a bunch of questions, triangulated lots of data, did my uh, homework, and um, didn't want to have, albeit what I thought was a, a very low chance to develop esophageal cancer, I figured I wanted to address this. Um, so I did my homework. I uh, learned about the Nissan fund application. I talked to multiple doctors. I learned about a link surgery. I learned about Strata. Um, and then I learned about TIF. Um, and I realized that I needed to get more data. Um, so I kind of turned this into a, a project that I could uh, actually learn and uh, um, process thoughtfully. So with that, um, I did the Bravo study, which I think, uh, as Dr. Nguyen mentioned, is really administered during a endoscopy, and it's a it's a no brainer. They basically put a little device inside you. They then um, give you a monitor, which you wear for four days, and it monitors the amount of acid that is basically coming up from your stomach. And uh, sure enough, it then produces something called a Demeester score. My Demeester score was above average. Uh, it's good to be above average in a lot of things, not in a Demeester score. So it seemed like I was a good candidate to get this addressed. Uh, what I also learned from my endoscopy is I had a hiatal hernia. Um, so with that, um, I determined that uh, a CTIF was the way I wanted to go. I liked the, the fact that it was, as the, as the TIF stands for, transoral incisionless fund implication. I like the natural aspect of that. Uh, I like the fact that they could do it simultaneously with the hiatal hernia repair. Um, so as I kind of talked to the other doctor that did the hiatal hernia repair before handing off to Dr. Nguyen, he kind of said to me, this was uh, Dr. Daryl Perlstein. He said, Robert, um, look at this as we're going to get your anatomy to work the way it's supposed to. So that made sense for me. So I kind of looked at the downside of it. And I was in great condition. It was a good time for me to maybe enter and do a surgery because this is elective. Um, and so I went ahead with it. And, you know, as I kind of asked my 97 questions, Dr. Nguyen at some point uh, needed to tell me that I had asked that question before. Um, but again, I, I did my homework. Um, and I think the hardest part as I looked at this was the recovery afterwards. So we can talk a little bit about that. Um, and that recovery is you know, the liquid diet that you need to go on for a bit of time. So for the first few days, it's a clear liquid diet and it's a liquid diet for two to three weeks. And then you get into soft foods. And Dr. Nguyen is, uh, is very, uh, she wants you to be very compliant. She's going to build you a nice valve. And she made sure I knew that. And part of the way that valve stays nice is that you are compliant to your recovery. Um, so I kind of turned it into a, a fun and, you know, my wife was very supportive. And with that, I got very, we got very proficient at creating lots of different types of soups. So whether it was the broccoli, potato cheese, or the spinach, zucchini, you basically can boil any vegetable and with a chicken broth, create a, a really enjoyable soup. So for the, for the first three weeks, that would, that's what really uh, my eating entailed. And then you get into having soft foods, cream of wheat and oatmeal, and then you can have certain uh, other foods. And here I am, what is today, January 31st. I had the procedure on uh, November 19th. Uh, exercise wise, I was a you know, exercise nut. So three days out, I was walking. Uh, a week out, I was walking five miles. Uh, two weeks out, I was walking hills. Uh, they encourage you to exercise and do what you normally do. Uh, the modification is you just got to let things heal uh, after this procedure so that the valve uh, heals properly. And with the hiatal hernia, if some of you have to consider that, um, there are internal sutures, which again, you don't want to be lifting weights or doing 
extreme exercise where you might uh, impact that good work that was done on the hiatal hernia. Um, basically, my surgery was between three to four hours. Um, and again, uh, the, the surgeon did the hiatal hernia repair, then uh, handed it off to Dr. Nguyen, who does her, uh, again, incisionless uh, endoscopy um, uh, approach to the, the, the TIF that she does. Uh, I couldn't be more pleased with what uh, has transpired. Uh, I would share with you some byproduct benefits that I wasn't really underwriting that uh, have come to me. I don't know if they will be the same for you if you all consider that. But for me, I kind of found it as a, a reset button uh, at 62 to you know eat more thoughtfully. To you know, I was a guy that would come home from work or exercise and would eat probably too quickly. Um, and that I'm sure had some impact on normal digestion. Uh, so I now chew my food more thoughtfully. I enjoy my food more. Uh, and I have found an odd benefit and maybe Dr. Nguyen can comment on it, but I have found I have more energy. And my wife will tell you that I'm a high energy guy to begin with, but I think the digestive process is now working the way it's supposed to. Acid is staying in the stomach. It's not kind of uh, breaching into the esophagus where it's not supposed to be. Uh, so it's early days. Uh, some describe it as like you have a new belt and suspenders, uh, but I'm really uh, back to normal eating. Uh, and that, you know, is uh, pro probably somewhat atypical. Like some people can take longer, um, but I was, I, I was a good patient for the first three to four weeks. So I'm sure that aided in my repair. Um, I would be happy to, you know, answer any questions that any, any of you might have. I think uh, Dr. Nguyen is a very thorough teacher. Uh, tonight, her presentation was fun to re-listen to because I picked up some new things uh, that remind me why this, uh, in fact, made sense for me to do. So when you say the reset button, um, what, what do you what do you mean um, in terms of your diet has changed and the way you eat and the way you feel? Or do you mean you got a brand new valve? It's a new baby that kind of reset. That sounds pretty yeah. exciting. Well, I think you, you said it well, uh, all of those things. I mean, it was a reset to just be more thoughtful about recognizing that thing that we take for a very natural activity, eating and digesting and processing. Um, I just now have a little bit more of an appreciation for that, that system and the importance uh, of it. And uh, I enjoy my food more. I take my time with eating where I would rush before. You know, I was probably atypical in that I wasn't overweight. Um, I didn't have a heart condition. But I thought it was a very good time for me to go ahead and do this procedure uh, because I was healthy uh, and I wanted to stay healthy, even though it was maybe a modest uh, potential for esophageal cancer. I didn't want to have that potential. So I, I wanted to nip it in the butt early, given kind of the, the pre barrets that was taking place. So one of the questions that came through um, uh, Robert, if I may call you Robert, um, sure, is uh, the the question: Why did you choose TIF over Lynx? So Lynx is a, a magnet that is surgically placed at the bottom of the esophagus at the sphincter, and the magnet opens up and allows food to go through. And once the food is through, the magnet closes back up, and you know you do your next swallow. Um, the, the Lynx magnet ring can be so good that we've noticed patients have problems swallowing. Was that your concern as you researched the two techniques? Yeah, as I mentioned before, I looked at the Nissan fund application, I looked at the Lynx, I looked at the Strata, and I really kept coming back to, I wanted something that was natural, that was gonna feel like it did before this uh, procedure. And it seemed to me the reviews that I looked at, the conversations I'd have, the diligence I did, was that the TIF had the best potential to get back to what I would call normality. And I didn't want to have too tight a valve that would uh, cause, you know, belching or a, a dis discomfort 
Um, and I can truthfully say it that just two and a half months out, I have very little feeling of discomfort. I clearly can tell that I have a new mechanism. I have a new valve that behaves differently. And it it's also it's it's good in a way in that it, it reminds me not to rush my eating. But by no way am I uh, impacted in enjoying a meal and, and like I did in the past. Yeah, I think how what happens over the years of eating as we eat larger meals, your stomach descends and that kind of pushes it up onto the diaphragm and then the cre creation of hernia and the disruption of the mechanism. So I think for a good diet, the smaller meals are probably going to be better, something that will help to last uh, a longer time. The traditional Nissan fundamentation, I think the wrap is really good that you can have a similar problem like the Lynx device with uh, problem swallowing and problem burping and kind of a bloating um, and you uh, kind of a gas bloat um, problem associated with it. Um, I have so many questions and some of them are for you. So I'll address the ones that are related. Um, so, um, okay, let's see. Um, were you on, uh, Robert, were you on PPI before the procedure? Uh, I was not. That's not to say that maybe I shouldn't have been. Um, I just, again, felt that I, di I didn't have conventional heartburn. I have friends that are on, um, whether it's Nexium or Prilosec, they take two a day. Uh, if they don't, they have a lot of pain. So I didn't have that. I had something more akin to an LPR, I would call it, which you pronounced in the laryngopharyngeal reflux, which- I can't uh, say it either. <laughs> LPR. Uh, um, LPR, yeah. Which, so mine was more, uh, where, where I would notice that I was always clearing my throat. How's uh, that now? I don't, I, I stopped doing that. Uh, really? So that's not happening. It's yet. gone? It's gone, yeah. So that's good. Really? Um, and I think that's just, a, nice. you know, being purposeful um, because it creates that raspy voice, which it sounds like I have right now, but that's for too much money. on the Rams game, yeah. yeah right. <laughs> okay. So actually patients with uh, diagnosis of Barrett's uh, should be on PPI. So um, if we had not approached this and repaired the condition, we would like you to be on a PPI. Um, because we want to suppress the acid. So once you have the Barrett's diagnosis, and I think we talked about this, um, being yeah. on a chronic PPI, yeah, yeah. to suppress acid, yeah. Um, well, you have a lot of questions. Are you ready for this? Okay. <laughs> um, okay, let me see. Um, are you also now more careful about enough laps between the meals? So... I think, uh, are you doing meal after meal after meal, or do you want to wait uh, a period between the meals? Well, um, there's the time when you, right, as you're, as you're in your recovery and you're, you know, getting back to eating what I would call more normally, but I'm a proponent of eating four to five small meals a day. Part of that is to work within my exercise routine, but I think that's probably better for you, at least I believe just to keep the energy levels. Uh, but I haven't changed my eating because of this necessarily. I've always been a proponent of smaller meals. Uh, so it hasn't, it hasn't impacted the way I eat. Okay. Um, I think uh, the next question is, can the TIF procedure be undone easily in case of problems? So, um, the Lynx device is um, removable, so it's reversible. So whatever we place, we can remove. Uh, for TIF, once the sutures are in and we place so many, um, it's not reversible. So we can revise it, we can adjust it. So in the future, if you needed us to change, um, augment it, revise it, we can, but it cannot be undone. So the sutures are there, they're there to stay. They can fall off naturally, but there's no way for us mechanism wise or endoscopic wise to go on, go down endoscopically and remove the sutures. So it's not um, reversible, but we can fix um, what's there. Um, how quickly can a hiatal hernia grow and become a more serious problem? 
Um, I think it, that depends on, uh, we think that GERD is hereditary. So there's some, some genetic factors that go into the equation. There's your life and how we eat and uh, how much weight we have uh, on board. Um, so the progression is noted. Uh, once you have a hiatal hernia, it will worsen. It doesn't fix and it doesn't resolve itself. And it usually gets worse over the years. Um, how fast it grows, I don't think we can tell you, um, but usually it does worsen over the years. Um, and it's not the hernia that we focus on, but it's actually the GERD and the symptoms associated with the GERD. And of course, the Barrett's esophagus, which uh, Robert is concerned with. Um, the next question is, I have a small head of hernia and having increasing incidence of chest pain. So I think we uh, covered it in the first few slides and I think it's very important that um, patients with chest pain have a cardiology evaluation, make sure it's not cardiac in origin. And once a cardiologist has evaluated, done the stress test, you know, echo, whatever it is that is necessary to rule out a heart condition. Then you're looking at a large patient population with chest pain that are thought to be non-cardiac. And in that category, GERD is fairly common. Um, so it may be that we need to do uh, further testing, a pH study maybe, like Robert uh, talked about with the Bravo system, looking at, uh, is it GERD? That you have. And we can uh, correlate the symptom of chest pain with a reflux event to see if the chest pain is associated. Um, so I think that takes care of that. And so many questions for Robert. I think it's so not fair, Robert. <laughs> um, uh, well, don't give me any, any years. <laughs> so many questions for you. Okay. Um, do you find that you're able to recline after a meal without an issue? This is so important question. Sure. Um, well, I do recline after a meal, uh, like most of us, and uh, I don't find any um, impact at all. I mean, again, um, for me, it was, I didn't have real pronounced uh, regurgitation or pronounced reflux or heartburn. Uh, but having said that, uh, nothing that is uncomfortable in the least for following this procedure for me. So I might not be the best person to ask because I, I didn't feel a lot of that before and when I re would recline. Yeah, patients prior to uh, fun application, however it is that we fix the GERD, um, often sleep at night with the bed on an incline so that they have gravity to protect against regurgitation. So the gradually the incline is more. And I noticed some patients at the end of the night, they slide off and they're off their bed because it's such an incline. Um, after uh, the fun placation, again, and no matter how we fix it, uh, patients report to me that they're able to sleep flat, they can sleep on their side, and they can sleep in all different positions and not worry about um, being on an incline. Um, for patients with GERD, we usually ask that you wait, uh, patients wait three to four hours after a meal before you actually go to sleep and wait until the stomach are uh, empty uh, somewhat. Um, so that's, we climbed after Nguyen, a meal. Dr. Nguyen, I might just add, when I mentioned the reset, that's a good example. I would tell you in the, prior to this, I would often maybe go to bed an hour or half an hour after eating. And I'm sure that was not good. So now I'm more purposeful in just kind of resetting schedules, rethinking when to eat and those good things. Um, I... Yeah, I'd be excited to see what your esophagus looks like at a year, five years. Uh, we're hoping for regression of the Barrett's, definitely, yes. right? Absolutely. That'd be wonderful. Um, so can GERD be resolved with diet changes? And um, we talked a little bit about um, dietary changes and lifestyle changes. Um, and one of my prior talk from last week, we covered all different types of foods that increase GERD. So if you can avoid those foods um, and some foods are more implicated, 
Um, if you can avoid the foods that bring on the GERD symptoms, then that will help. Um, smaller meals, like Robert talked about, don't sleep so uh, soon after your meal. Um, but this is difficult because if you avoid all the things that are on this list that can cause GERD, then there's nothing left to eat. And I joke a lot and I, I tell my patients, well, you know, you can drink water um, and you don't won't have GERD, but patients actually have reflux even with water. You can drink a little bit of water and have regurgitation. So it's no joke, um, very difficult to do diet and lifestyle change um, for some of the symptoms of GERD. Of course, uh, the milder symptoms you can try um, and do these dietary changes to see if your symptoms improve. You know, I, ju I might just mention, Dr. Nguyen, you know, for me, one of the reasons to do this was I wanted to maintain a quality of life that I to enjoy certain foods. And uh, so I have had a glass of wine and enjoyed it and haven't had uh, a reaction. So um, I, think, I think it's important. You don't want to, uh, you know, keep yourself from uh, a coffee once in a while, um, or a chocolate, but you just need to know what some of the some of the foods and are that are probably not ideal for that condition. Yeah. So before we uh, fix the GERD, patients often say, you know, they can't even eat a bite of tomato. Half a glass of wine would bring on the symptom. After the phenylation, patients can enjoy their food. They drink their wine. Of course, we encourage moderation. Um, if you're excessive with it, um, uh, excess with anything is not good. And um, patients now enjoy food and it's really great um, to have a glass of wine now and then and uh, have a zucchini or a cup of coffee. Um, it's, uh, it's life. It's what we live for. Um, Robert, you have too yeah. many questions here. Sorry. <laughs> um, Robert, have you experienced a problem with food getting stuck in your new setup? So I think it's in an acute uh, period, like the first six weeks, and then maybe you can talk about now. Sure. Uh, great question, because it's something I figured out uh, very soon, because when you have this procedure, Dr. Nguyen will have you spend the night at the hospital. Um, which is uh, no big deal. Uh, they want to monitor you. You're given ice. Um, you're not drinking anything. But interestingly, to get checked out the next day, they require you to have some food. So I thought I, I was that was odd to me because I said, well, I'm for the next two to three weeks, I'm not supposed to eat anything, just drink things. But they want to make sure that you're esophagus and your digestion can work. So I had to have some cream of wheat or some pudding, or there was one other yogurt and they, they would not let me go until I had that. And to my surprise, it went down fine. So that kind of gave me a subconscious comfort that, uh, you know, I, I will be able to eat again. The, the real need for the two to three weeks to not eat is to allow the repair to happen uh, after all the surgery that's taken place, right? Uh, it just it needs to heal. So it heals better with just fluid intake. Yeah, Fair. the first uh, day of that clear liquid is to let the area heal, decrease the swelling, and then a couple of weeks of thicker liquids and you want to gradually go into the next stage. And you're pretty much at a back to a normal diet at six weeks. So right now, do you have any problems swallowing? You eat normal? No, no, problem. no problems at all. Okay. Um, so a uh, question on, the, are the procedures mentioned covered by insurance? And yes, uh, Medicare, particularly HMOs, PPOs, we've had uh, no problem getting authorization. Um, strata, strata, I think Robert covered, is uh, radio frequency ablation um, at the G junction and is thought to cause collagen deposition and shrinkage of that area. And I think it's used in earlier conditions, uh, earlier GERD, um, and I don't have coverage details on strata, but I do not think that it is widely covered. Um, okay, can you get Barrett's esophagus without having GERD? I think 
Um, Barrett's is thought to be from GERD. Um, so once you have Barrett's, um, hands down, you have GERD. Um, there's no other reason for it. Um, uh, similar question about swallowing. Uh, primary care physician mentioned that a patient had problem choking on food after TIF. Um, and patient thought it may be that the TIF device uh, created a valve that's too tight. Is that a common problem? And actually, no, it is not. Um, it could be that earlier on, if the patient advanced the diet too quickly, uh, they can have, uh, the food can feel like it's slow to pass. And if it's slow to pass, it can go back up. It actually didn't go through into the stomach yet, but I see that patients advance too quickly. Um, some patients swear they ate a French fry and they chewed it really well, <laughs> but it still didn't pass. And I said, please don't try that because we don't want to go down and fish it out. And so if we cheat on the diet that we recommend, um, you're going to run into problem. But the, the reason we don't have problems swallowing with the TIF valve or the procedure is it's never going to be smaller than the device itself. Okay, so, and it's that 270 degree wrap that's different than Nissan and different than Lynx. It's not 360. So it accomplished that balance. It's just the amount, the right amount to prevent reflux. And it's not too tight that you can still eat. And that's why dysphagia or problem swallowing is not what we see in our studies or in my experience. Um, do PPIs cause cancer? And I think there was a very good study that just recently came out, um, chronic PPI and uh, colon cancer. PPI use uh, chronically is not, to, it's not thought to cause stomach cancer, as far as I'm aware. A lump in my throat is a question. Um, a feeling of something there all the time, it's not associated with eating. Um, but uh, patient unable to tolerate PPI, would TIF be the solution like Robert? Um, Robert, do you want to tackle this one? Because I think you know so much about TIF. So a lump in your throat. Unable yeah, to again, tolerate PPI. I think you're, you're certainly the, uh, the MD. I would just say when I did my research on LPR, lump in the throat is uh, a common diagnostic. So um, I remember at times feeling a little um, just sticky, uh, and it, it, food didn't maybe go down as, as much as, uh, you would like. So, um, certainly I don't have that condition now and it wasn't pronounced for me. So I'm probably not the best person to answer it, but I think this is a very normal diagnostic of LPR, if I'm not mistaken. Yes. Uh, lump in the throat, throat discomfort, uh, the constant <clears throat> clearing of the throat, uh, can be. And the diagnostic test would be a pH study to look and see if there's GERD. And um, if you're unable to tolerate the PPI. So the thing with the PPI to treat the LPR is it's not gonna be effective right away. So patients with heartburn, we give the patient PPI, within a few days, they feel better. But with LPR and the atypical symptoms, sometimes it takes a few months of the PPI to see an improvement in symptoms. So you have to be religious with it, stick with it, and see if it works, but give it a chance. Um, and it, the intolerance, patients get a lot of side effects from it too. Some patients report diarrhea, some patients that describe abdominal bloating, um, uh, and there's some issues with taking PPI long-term. So if we think that the lump in the throat is GERD related, let's diagnose it. I think let's take a look and do a pH study. Is it GERD? And if it is GERD, can we fix it? And can we treat it? Um, next question is how many patients find that the TIF needs to be loosened to allow easier swallowing? And I have not in my experience, uh, gone down and dilated it. Um, acutely, within the first six weeks, we want to work on the diet, uh, slower on the eating progression so that the, the swelling can decrease. We've not had to use 
uh, anti-inflammatory agents like steroids to decrease the swelling either. Um, we mostly work on the diet. And then after six weeks, I've not had to dilate the valve. Um, we don't want to dilate the valve because we want the valve to work. So once you dilate it, you worry about uh, GERD, right? So you want that good balance. Um, and we've not had to dilate um, the valve once placed. Um, if there is a hernia involved, what is the recovery and diet like? Okay, so um, I think the question is TIP and C-TIP. So TIP alone and C-TIP, the recovery is very similar. We usually keep the patients overnight. We watch for um, how they recover. Uh, the sore throat will be there the next day. We give patients clear liquids. And if they're able to tolerate the clear liquids, Patients go home, it's not even a full one day hospital stay. Um, and uh, the, the liquid diet that we talked about um, and the, the diet is for me, I think it's more the weight loss that we accomplished that I really love. And the, the more we stick with the diet, the less the complications and the more weight loss. And that's a huge benefit in terms of GERD. You lose the weight and the GERD will get better. You regain the weight and the GERD will come back and it's, it's an automatic. So we use that diet to accomplish the weight loss initially. And it's, it's like a bonus. I love it. And patients usually lose about 20 pounds. I know Robert, we said, no, you cannot lose weight. You're already too skinny. <laughs> How much weight did you end up losing? Uh, well, yeah, unfortunately I probably lost 12 pounds, but yeah, um, yeah not that's, terrible. But I, that's I, a lot I, for I, you. I put, about, I put about half of it back on. I just might answer um, Dr. Nguyen, if I may, for the, the, uh, the, the audience member that asked, uh, the hiatal hernia, you, you, you end up, depending if you do it laparoscopically or you do it through the da Vinci robot, there's different incisions and approaches to it. I did a um, one through the da Vinci. You get five little holes, kind of four down below, uh, right by your below your belly button. And then one and then one kind of in the middle above your belly button. And uh, short of those, no stitches come out at all. It's, it's done internally. Um, but, you know, it, no extra care per se, uh, but you certainly have to address that if you have a C-tip versus just a TIF. Um, it's really just in terms of lifting and getting back to some robust exercise is I would say the impact of the hiatal hernia uh, recovery uh, would be best way to describe it. Yeah, I think because we understand that it's the two sphincters, the diaphragm and the lower septal sphincter. So the C-TIF that you had, the hernia repair and TIF takes care of both of the mechanisms that are failed. Right. Yeah, so the repair is usually, like you said, either laparoscopic or robotic. So the difference between the two, uh, still little, very, very tiny little incisions in the abdomen. The laparoscope is the actual um, at the body with the device and we're pulling the stomach down, repairing the diaphragm. Robotic approach is similar to that, but it's just, just a huge robot with X arms that do the work and it does the work more efficiently, I think, and more effectively. Um, the surgeon is off in the corner operating the robot. That's where the body is. Um, so the height of hernia repair and fun application accomplished both those things that are important um, in GERD. Yeah. Uh, how about um, swallowing pills after TIF? Ah, good one. Uh, do you want to take that one? Well, I mean, I, I would just share, I had to crush the pills that I do take, which were more vitamin based. Um, I have a, a, a low grade statin I take. So you just crush it and then you drink it with water. But probably um, six weeks into it, I was having pills like I normally did. Although interestingly, I used to was fine taking my pills four at a time, five at a time. Now I take them one at a time just to be more thoughtful. <laughs> <laughs> that reset. I like that word. Reset. reset. Yeah. yeah. So pills will not pass uh, initially in that recovery period. So we ask that patients either crush or break the pill if allowed by the pharmacist. 
And at six weeks, as a patient go back to a normal diet, then you know you can try the pills. Um, but initially, we would like no pills. Um, last question. I think we're running on time. Is nausea, particularly in the morning, a symptom of GERD? Um, I, I, I'm not sure. Um, sometimes patients state that they wake up and they're immediately hit by heartburn or uh, the, the body is just learning how to eat again and they have some swallowing issues in the morning as they wake up because they've slept so, so long that the, the body has slept also. Um, but AM nausea, I don't know that it's associated with GERD. Um, if it is, it's an uh, uncommon or atypical. Okay, I think we are good. And I don't have any other questions in the chat box. And I really thank everyone for your attention tonight. And Robert, it's been a pleasure. And I thank you tremendously. Pleasure. Pleasure's mine. Um, I couldn't have done this without you. And if you have further questions, you can send it our way. And uh, have a beautiful night. Oh, today is New Year's Eve uh, or the Lunar New Year. And so <laughs> Happy New Year, everyone. Tomorrow's the first. I think year of the dragon. Okay. Good night. Thank you. Good night, everyone. Thank Thanks. you.